Hello and welcome to ELT Time with Garnet Education, where we talk with an industry guest about the hot topics and what's brewing in the ELT community. Hi, welcome back to ELT Time. Today, we've got a bit of a different one. We're actually introducing a new feature onto the show, and that's Tea Break. It's called Tea Break because we wanted a chance for a few of us here at Garnet to grab a cup of tea, sit down for half an hour, and discuss something that interests us that's related to ELT. And that's Tea Break. We hope you enjoy. Let us know if you do. And if you like this style, there'll be another episode of Tea Break coming up later on in the season. Okay, with that out of the way and teas at the ready, on to the episode. Hi, welcome to today's episode of the podcast. Today we're talking about varieties of English, uh, specifically Australian and Scottish English, as well as accents and dialects of native English speakers. We're talking to a few people from the office today. I'll start by introducing myself. So I'm Jazz, I'm from Dorset. Hi, I'm Alice, I'm the Australian contingent. Um, I'm Ella and I'm from Essex. I'm Rosie, I'm from Scotland. Nice. So we've got kind of a variety. Yeah. yeah. We've got South East, South West and then a bit further afield. A bit further afield. <laughs> south, South. <laughs> really Antipodean, south. as they say. It's a good word there, I like that word. I didn't say know that, it until they? I moved here because we're not Antipodean to ourselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know what it means. It literally means opposite feet or opposite standing but because we're on the opposite side oh, of the world. So Australians and New were. Zealanders, two English people, are Antipodean. Antipodean. Wow. And I guess technically that makes English people Antipodean to us. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. just don't really say it or if we do, I haven't heard it. But we call Australia and New Zealand the Antipodes. There you go. I think we've all learned something today. Yeah, so you're uh, you're from Australia, I am. and now you live here, so yes. tell us about that. I have changed the way that I speak since moving here, so I've been here for about two and a half, nearly three years, um, and I have definitely assimilated, I guess. Mm. Um, I can hear my accent getting stronger when I talk to my friends and family on the phone, so I know that my accent must be mellowing out, even if it doesn't sound like it to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I moved here to do an exchange semester in London. I actually went to a school which is designed for people on exchange, so most of the students there were American, so I didn't really move into sort of English culture. That's I ended up in like a weird American bubble in the middle of mm. London. And then when I finished that, I got a job with some English people, which is when I first noticed that I talk like a weirdo. Uh, I got a lot of people making fun of the way I pronounce things like the word tour, because I use it with two syllables, and in England, apparently, it's only got one. Tour. Tour. It's interesting how Australian and American, some, like, some of the words, the way you pronounce things, and some of the terms used, I feel like, are quite similar, which is quite interesting because we're quite far away from each other. I think in Australia we have a sort of weird melting pot of different cultures so <laughs> often you'll find both the british and american pronunciations are acceptable nobody really knows which one is the right one we spell most things the english way so we don't use z spellings or like color or color yeah we keep the u in color and favorite and neighbor but yeah you can you can pronounce lever or lever mm-hmm. or data or data or data <laughs> uh, and no one really minds either way interesting mm. The first job I had while I was in the UK, I was sort of a tour guide, so I met people from a a tour guide. (laughs) So I met people from all over the world, and a lot of people that worked there had actually moved from other countries and other parts of the UK. So it was a lot of different accents all in one building, whereas here at Garnet we have quite a lot of local accents, or at least to my untrained ear, they sound fairly similar. I think they are quite similar. Where you worked before, was it a lot of people's first jobs in the UK? Quite a few people, yeah. We had um, quite a few people from Europe. Uh, definitely one French speaker who was better at speaking English than most of the English people. She mm. had a master's degree in English, which was quite funny. That she was, everybody else was just like, "How are you so good at English?" She was like, "I studied it, and you didn't." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we had a few Australians, yeah. which was nice. We called ourselves the Gangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always nice having someone who who knew the same like cultural references references yeah because i might say something like you should rug up it's cold outside and my housemate will go what what does rug up mean mean? surely you mean wrap up 
Uh, no, I don't. What, I mean, what does rug up mean? Um, it, I mean, it's the same thing as as wrap up. Basically, just put on something warm because it's cold out. It, I think, I looked it up after I got um, questioned. <laughs> I think it comes from the idea of putting a rug on a horse so the horse doesn't get cold. Oh. Um, that's interesting, though. Specific yeah. idioms that come from Australia that haven't quite made it to other parts of the world. Yeah. Mm. I do find that sometimes I say things and people just look at me funny. But then I do the same thing the other way around. Someone was talking about police officers the other day and they called them Rosers, I think. Yeah. yeah. It just went right over my head. <laughs> Rosa yeah. was my nickname in high school sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, the different words that you have for like specific things mm. in different countries. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. The first time I felt really homesick was when I was grocery shopping for the first time in the UK. Because like <laughs> English and Australian cultures are quite similar. We eat similar foods. We watch similar sports we obviously we speak the same language um so it wasn't completely apparent to me that i was on the other side of the planet until i went grocery shopping and your capsicums are called peppers capsicum yeah Mm. a a pepper is a capsicum wow that's a really i didn't know that yeah Yeah. and that's like a specific uh, so it's not an american thing as well right yeah i think that's just us yeah, yeah. I think yeah. capsicum would be the Latin name in some way. Yeah, I think the chemical that makes chili spicy is called capsation or something similar. Mm. So it comes from that, I think. I love some etymology. Yeah, mm. I try. It really fascinates me the difference between Australian and, and English English. Um, so I do spend a lot of time just googling. Like, have I just made something up on the spot, or is this a specifically Australian thing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I was talking to an Australian friend amongst a group of other people and the English people were talking about dungarees and my Australian friend is like what does that mean? Overalls in Australia. Oh. Yeah. See an overall yeah. would be like long sleeved here. Yeah. yeah. It's both in Australia. I think of dungarees as the with the straps and like often made out of denim yeah. as well. Like you're dressing up like a farmer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas overalls are like what you wear if you're painting a house. Yeah. Uh, yeah but in Australia it's both of those things. Which can get a bit confusing. My um, my stepsister, when we were about fifteen, really wanted some overalls because they were trendy. Um, and my dad dug out the painting overalls from the back of the garage. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's really funny. Yeah, that is funny. What were you? You were saying something the other day about mm, like eggs or something. Oh right, slippery dips. What is a slippery dip, Alice? Slippery dip is a slide like a in a children's playground. There's a children's <laughs> song which gives you instructions on how to look after yourself badly, including washing your face with orange juice. And one of the instructions is to fry an egg on a slippery dip, which I said to the office at large, um, to a lot of confusion. Yes. And laughter. Yes. I also find that people expect me to say a lot of things that are Australian stereotypes that I don't say. Mm. No one in Australia has ever thrown a shrimp on the barbie. We don't actually <laughs> say shrimp. Oh, really? Yeah. We say prawns. That's really funny. Or like when um, Simon keeps coming over to ask me if uh, if I call people flaming galahs or if I think someone's being a flaming galah, which is a stand-in for a swear word in, in an Australian soap opera, but nobody's ever actually said it because we just say the swear words. Mm. Um, so I would never call someone a flaming galah just because I would say the choose swear the swear word instead. Yeah. <laughs> is, isn't galah a thing? A galah is a kind of cockatoo. They're pink and they're known for being a little bit stupid, which is why a flaming galah is an idiot. But a stupid bird. (laughs) A stupid bird. Yeah, interesting. Um, Okay, so what about you, Rosie? You you were saying earlier on about how you didn't really think you had much of an accent until you moved down south. Yeah, I'm, I'm not very aware of how I sound to other people. I thought I sounded very English. And arguably I do because it turns out Jazz didn't even know I was yeah, Scottish. Yeah, I wasn't sure, but then I don't have an ear for accents. <laughs> <laughs> um, when someone told me that you were Scottish, or when I found out that you were Scottish rather, I can then hear it, I can then hear the lilts of Scott. <laughs> but before that, yeah, that might just be me. Yeah. <laughs> Weirdly, I sound a lot more Scottish to myself when I listen to my voice recorded than I do in my own head. Which is interesting. To interesting. Me. I is find interesting. similarly, if I hear a recording of myself, I can hear my accent far more than when I'm just talking. Mm. Mm. Although occasionally I'll say something and I'll be like, oh, that was very Australian. <laughs> <laughs> I said to Chris once when he was making his little tiny espresso thing, you know, the spout comes down, right? And Matt just laughed at me for like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm, that's funny. 
Yeah, it's interesting about what you were saying about being the representative Australia, Australian and wondering whether, hold on, is this just me? I feel that way a lot. When I commit to saying something about Scotland or that's something Scottish, mm. every single time I'm suddenly like, oh God, is that just, that's just me or just my family? Yeah. That's a rosy thing, that's not a Scottish thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that a lot. Because also with you, like, your your references might be from your parents and one of them is not Scottish or both of them are not Scottish? Yeah, they're both naturalised English, you could say. Uh, my dad's parents were Scottish. I see. So that's interesting because I often wonder when I have a phrase or something, whether it's from my English side or my Wales side or some other kind of American thing that I've picked up from TV and I never really know where mm. it's from. Mm-hmm. You lived in America for quite some time, right, Helen? Yeah, I did. I lived in America when I was um, like a preteen, I suppose. So I think not age 9 to 13, which is quite an interesting time because, you know, you do change quite a lot. And when I came back to England, everybody said that I had an American accent, which I can't really confirm or deny. Did you I notice think... any phrases that were American that you said? I think, back? well, I think, you know, just kind of really generic things like, you know, the cookie. I'd say cookie instead of biscuit. But I think another thing that's interesting is, is pronunciation of words. We, we often have uh, conversations in our office about different pronunciations of words and what is right. Yeah, there's sometimes technically a proper way to use a word, but if you're understanding what someone is saying and, you know, it's not halting the conversation, there is an argument for, does it really matter? Does it really matter that something is pronounced differently? Especially I don't know. If there's kind of a conversation at the moment about RP and whether that should be used yeah. as the default for teaching English. Like, you could teach people different ways of saying, pronouncing words, but then that makes it more confusing if you don't use RP. Yeah, what do you use? Do mm. you guys want to explain what RP is? RP is received pronunciation. When I say it's like somebody who's like a newsreader or something, but luckily that is cha- that has changed now. Yeah, so you definitely. you get people from different, like, the different accents who read the news, but... So it's considered like the baseline it's of like English. It's like neutral. It's supposed to be neutral but English, it's but it's often quite people who are quite posh. So there's a bit of a class thing. It's it definitely, definitely, a, class thing. definitely a class thing. This mm. is the correct, in inverted commas, way to speak English. Yeah. Everyone else who's from different regions around the UK speak it wrong, in inverted commas. So, for example, Jazz brought up something about... Oh when you're teaching vowels, for example, that can be an issue. Yeah, so we were talking earlier about, um, as me and Rosie in the digital team, digitising um, our activities in our course books and workbooks, and there's a specific activity that we remember where they're testing vowels and the pronunciation of words and like identifying what vowel is used in a word. And so you have to sort the words into the correct column, depending on the vowel sound. And the word was last or past or, you know, one of the two. As I would say it, I would say last. But, you know, there's a lot of people that would say last or past. And that's not that's not incorrect. That's very a northern way of saying it. And is a Scottish way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. And Welsh as well. And Welsh. And it's 100% not wrong. It's not wrong at all. And in a native speakers. Exactly. Saying it that way. Yeah. And in a classroom, that's a very easy thing to like, you know, bring up a conversation. And hopefully those conversations do happen in the classroom. Or the classroom. Or the classroom. Exactly. (laughs) But when digitizing things, everything becomes a little bit more simple and you don't want it to become a case of if you put last into that column, it's correct. But if you put it into the last column, it's wrong. Because that's obviously then quite an issue. Absolutely not. When we're designing there's a bit of digital jargon for you here but (laughs) writing the instructional design so taking it from a print activity print exercise into a digital activity yeah using the phonetics which is a much broader problem than just using phonetics but the phonetic spelling of a thing i often have no idea what i'm supposed to put simply because because you pronounce not how i would pronounce it at all i come i'm I'm coming at it from a completely different place if i'm mid-flow writing an instructional design document, I hit something about phonetics where you have to define whether an answer is right or wrong, Yeah. purely based on one way of saying a word. It gets very difficult because it means we have to say, everyone's got to say it, RP. Yeah, and there's definitely a limit to obviously allowing other dialects or allowing last and last to both be correct. But at the end of the day, then you have to have a C answers where you click and you see what the correct answer is, meaning that there's a correct or there's a right and a wrong. 
and it's just more of a nuanced issue than that. So yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. I hope that these kind of discussions will happen if they're doing this work in the classroom. You can hope. <laughs> As we said, RP is basically a myth. Everyone's from somewhere. No one really speaks RP. Which is then interesting how it's such a standard way of teaching, yet no one actually speaks it. I find the regional accents really interesting because the uh, the UK is a really quite a small country, particularly in comparison to Australia, but the accent difference is so much more apparent. Mm-hmm. You can have two cities right next to each other, like Manchester and Liverpool, and people from those cities sound completely different. Mm-hmm. Whereas you can get people from opposite ends of Australia who will sound very similar. Mm. Their accent might be a bit stronger depending on where they're from, but it wouldn't be a completely different accent. It's just the same Australian accent, but a bit firmer. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell what part of Australia someone's from just by talking to them. And similarly, I'm from Essex, but I've had people, when I've lived in other parts of the UK, say, you don't sound like you're from Essex because the stereotype is, you know, cutting cutting off words, you know, like butter. Butter. They have a view of what people are going to sound like. It's always exaggerated, right? Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of going back to what you were saying about Australians and they're throwing their shrimps on the Barbies. Do you say Barbie? Like barbecue? Yeah, we do. We um, we have a bit of a reputation for being very lazy with our accents and our words, so we do shorten things a lot. Mm. Like Arvo instead of afternoon. If you shorten it to the first like syllable or two and then add an O, you'll sound Australian. Arvo, (laughs) servo... Servo. servo. Uh, it's just petrol station or a service station. Servo. servo. <laughs> yeah. Or we have a lot of trades. You'll just shorten to a bricklayer is a bricky. Um, <laughs> we say that here. Do you say that? I think bricky. Yeah. I think other thing. Or well, like a plumber. She's got a thing electricians or sparkies. Sparky. <gasps> that's like incredible. That. <laughs> yeah. I think that's my favorite. But if, not everybody uses those as well. It's a spark. There's a bit of a class thing there as well as to how much you drop your syllables, I think. Or a perceived class thing. You're sort of perceived as less educated the more you drop use things. slang and drop mm. things. Yeah. Which we all know isn't true. Exactly. <laughs> Another problem that gets thrown up is this issue of voice recognition. Yeah, it's definitely a thing which, from someone who has a very standard, quite posh sounding, I guess, accent... I didn't notice at all until Rosie the Scot and Alice the Australian entered and suddenly their words weren't being accepted as correct. Whereas mine, fully correct every single time because of RP, I guess, because it's been programmed to recognise RP, RP, which is not And the audio that um, that the kids listen to and then have to repeat is RP pronounced, right? So they have to kind of mimic that. So, yeah, I suppose it makes sense that they have to say it the way that they're hearing it. But Whereas Rosie and I have already learned the words, so we're not trying to imitate the audio recording. But it's not every word either, it's just a couple of things. Like, I have the most trouble with the word ear, which I have to get <laughs> Ella to say into the microphone for me. Ella? Ear. Uh, because I don't pronounce the R at the end of that word. We, uh, as Australians, mm. I say as if I am the entire country, uh, we, <laughs> we tend to drop post-vocalic R's. My sister says them, and people point it out a lot. Wow. Well, she points it out a lot as well when she does it, which I think is quite funny. The thing is, from my perspective, the way Ella says it is dropping the R as well. I don't know now. <laughs> Ear. 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 She actually says ear. 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 Interesting. It is interesting because every person who teaches English, they will come with their, you know, their own specific accent and the way that they say certain words. And then, especially when you're teaching kids, they will kind of like, you know, mimic the way that you say things. So if you're a kid in China and your teacher is, for example, from Northern Ireland, then you'll say certain words with a slight Northern Irish twang. I think as native speakers we have the same problem is that we will Mm. we learn our accents from whoever's taught us to speak so usually our parents i suppose Mm. so i don't know if i'm saying australian things or things that have been carried down through Mm. generations from from england even Mm -hmm. yeah just a your family thing yeah it's interesting in the uk i think in a way it's like we're more familiar with americanisms than maybe australian Mm. terms completely definitely a tv like tv and film i guess Yeah. yeah Media. So stuff that I'm like, oh, that's a really American thing to say, but it's actually just 
it's also just Australian. But the context that I have for it is always, you know, an American film. Or yeah, something. yeah. And then we come across some things that are uniquely Australian, like Manchester. Manchester, that was a very, that's a very weird one. Can you tell us what Manchester means? In Australia, Manchester is sort of an umbrella term for household linen. Well, it's mostly used for bedding, so sheets and stuff like that, but it also covers tablecloths, towels, curtains, anything made of fabric that you put up in your house is the Manchester department of a shop. So you'd only really use that word when you're talking about a section of a shop. Where's the Manchester? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, we can't help but giggle because it sounds so funny to us. <laughs> Whereas obviously in the UK, Manchester is a city. Uh, apparently we got that phrase from the fact that most of these fabrics, when they got shipped over to Australia initially, were coming from Manchester, so the boxes would say Manchester on them. And we just picked that up as a slang term for it. I love that. Um, it's always interesting discovering things that I didn't know were just Australian. Mm. For instance, the idiom, um, you look like a shag on a rock, is a very uniquely Australian thing. And a shag is a kind of bird which is similar to a cormorant, and it's known for sort of standing by itself and standing out, looking a bit awkward and isolated, but also like really obviously alone. So Mm. if you're at a party and you look like a shag on a rock, it's because you're standing there really awkwardly and you feel very exposed. But no one's going to know what that means if I say it to them here. We will now. (laughs) Any final words from anyone? Car tours. Haberdashery. Gert. Capsicum. <laughs> My new favourite word. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions or comments about what we've talked about today, feel free to send us a tweet. At Ghana Education. We would love to hear from you. Yes. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 And that's it from us today. If you'd like to get in touch or to see our latest updates, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at Garnet Education or head to garneteducation.com forward slash podcast for show notes and information about today's guest. Thanks for listening.